yes uh, welcome back so we were uh, looking at paul's letter uh, paul's prayer for the colossian believers uh, verse 9 onwards all the way up to verse 14 uh, so the first prayer request uh, which he is asking from the lord he says we continually ask god to fill you with the knowledge of his will uh, so that why is he making this prayer so that they may live a life worthy of the lord and please him in every way you know um, we were looking at those missionary journeys in the second missionary journey paul and his companions want to go towards bithynia but then the holy spirit prompts them and says no that they are not meant to go into bithynia so they say okay fine and they go towards troas and then paul has this uh, vision uh, where you know you have the macedonian man saying please come and help us so how did paul and his companions know that they are not supposed to enter into bithynia they were full of the knowledge of the will of god on a, on a daily basis you know not just simply knowing the general will of god but being so full of the knowledge of god where you know his will on a uh, regarding the things regarding the activities that you're doing on a daily basis jesus and his disciples were walking through the desert how did jesus know that he has to stop at that particular well you know he could have he could have uh, maybe walked another one kilometer and stopped somewhere else but why did he sense in his heart that that is the exact place where he should stop and rest so you see if a person is full of the knowledge of the will of god they will be able to take the right steps at the right time and that will make a huge uh, difference in their ministry and in their even even in their personal walk everything that they do they'll start doing it in the way god wants it done so that will be you know uh, that will please him in every way and it will be a life that is worthy of the lord so therefore it is good to know the general will of god it is also vital to be full of the knowledge of his will how do you gain access to something like this how do you become full of the knowledge of his will we are told that it comes through uh, the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so this is this should become a prayer point you know where we pray during our you know during our quiet time and say lord i need this wisdom and understanding which you alone can give me i want to walk in this kind of a wisdom and understanding so that lord if you, you know because he, it says very plainly that the holy spirit will give this to us if we ask for it you know he will give us this wisdom and understanding paul was asking it for those people we can ask it for ourselves and say lord give me this wisdom and understanding that comes from the spirit so that hour by hour i am filled with the knowledge of your will and i get all my decisions right so that i will do what i'm meant to do and it will be so pleasing to you you know so it's something that we can ask so the second prayer point that paul asks for these colossian believers is that you know they would be strengthened with all power this this would be verse 11 they would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might why why does he want them to be strengthened with all power so that you may have great endurance and patience when you become full of the knowledge of the of god's will you know there are so many things that god is going to be asking us to do we will not be able to do it in our own strength when you're you know ignorant and blind to what god wants you can sail through the whole day not even realizing that god had actually wanted so many things from you but once you become full of the knowledge of his will and you become aware that oh god wants me to call up so and so and speak to them god wants me to send spend half an hour in prayer interceding for someone once you start becoming aware of what God actually wants you to be doing with your day, then now, 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 now that you're aware of it, you would have to act upon it. And it's not something that you can do on your own. So he says, you know, you would need great endurance and patience to live in this way. And so Paul is saying that God would asking, uh, Paul is praying and asking the Lord to strengthen them with all power so that they will be able to exercise great endurance and patience and live in a way which is worthy of God. So we need to know God's will, but we need the strengthening and enabling of God himself to be able to actually do that will. And the third prayer point that we see over here, he says, 
and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. So uh, Paul says, my third prayer point is actually a praise point. I, I'm, I give joyful thanks to the Father because you guys have been qualified to share in the inheritance of his holy people. So they will begin to share in this inheritance, begin to enjoy this inheritance, even as they are full of the will of God, uh, full of the knowledge of the will of God, and they start acting out this will, obeying this will through the strengthening and enabling of the Holy Spirit himself. He will give them the patience and endurance they need to be able to do his will. Um, so that's basically a small prayer that he prays for them. And then he goes on to talk about this, uh, you know, this thing which is on his heart because there are wrong teachings which have been coming into the church. And he wants to stress that it is Jesus who should be the center of our focus. Um, it is Jesus who is supreme over all things, including the spirits. Um, so uh, somewhere around the end of chapter 2 is where he actually clearly says, please don't go away into angel worship. Okay, so that's basically what he's trying to, you know, uh, focus on. He's trying to tell them, do not go into angel worship. Do not go into all these Gnostic teachings which have started rising, uh, you know, where uh, you want spirits to come to you and reveal things to you so that you can boast about how great you are. He says, please don't get into all of these things. Jesus is the one who is supreme. He is supreme over everything, even over the spirits. So let your faith and your walk be focused on Jesus. So that is what he is focusing on right here. Uh, so um, uh, if we can uh, have someone read out for us, verses 15, um, maybe all the way up to verse 20. Yeah, 15 to 20, if we could have someone read out. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thr thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created through him and <clears throat> for him. Excuse me. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of, of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased yes. the Father. Amen. Oh, no, no, please go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Thank you. So uh, he, in these verses, Paul talks about the supreme status, the highest status that can be is given to Jesus. So he talks about that. Um, so he says, the son is the image of the invisible God. He is literally the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. Uh, not sure whether we have touched upon this in other classes. We most probably have. The word firstborn over here is not talking about Jesus being, um, you know, uh, being created by God as the firstborn in the creation process. No. Uh, because the, the, this is how the Jehovah Witnesses would use this particular verse. They say, see, in the beginning, God created the uh, created creation. And one of the first acts of creation which he created was Jesus. No, that is not what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying that Jesus is firstborn in that sense. It is saying he is firstborn over all creation. It's talking about a technical term. It's a legal term which refers to the inheritance, the authority which comes to the firstborn. 
So that word firstborn is not talking about someone being born biologically or not. It's talking about the legal status that they have, where they hold all the inheritance, where they exercise all of the authority. Um, so um, I, very difficult to remember what I have touched upon in which class. But in case I have not, maybe we should you know, when, uh, go look at this. In uh, biblical times, if a Jewish person, let us say he has two sons, uh, one of course is, uh, was born to him biologically first, and then the second son was born second. Uh, so as long as the first born son, the biologically first born son is alive, he's probably the one who would be inheriting the property. He's the one who would be given you know, full authority uh, in that household. So yes, he is literally the firstborn when it comes to biological birth. And when it comes to the legal sense of the term firstborn, also he is the firstborn in the sense he is the one who holds the inheritance. He is the one who uh, exercises the authority. But let us say he has an accident and he dies. He's now dead. Now the second born becomes the firstborn. Does it mean he somehow uh, miraculously uh, was biologically born first? No. It's not talking about his biological birth at all. The second born is now the first born in the legal sense. The second son is now holding the inheritance. He is now holding the authority. And legally, in all the paperwork, he would be termed as the first born, not because he was born biologically first, but because legally he is holding on to the inheritance and the authority in that sense. It's talking about Jesus' legal status. This is what Jesus' legal status is. He is the image of the invisible God. And legally, he is the one who is holding all of creation as his inheritance. And he's the one exercising authority over all of creation. That is who he is. Verse 16 goes on to elaborate on this. It says, for in him, all things were created. Everything that was created, it was created in him. It was through him that it, it was created. So obviously, he is the one who has um, legal inheritance, authority over all of creation because of who he is. It was in him that all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, so the things which you can see visibly on this earth, the trees and the mountains and the natural resources and the human beings, yes, he is. He has ultimate authority over all of these now, things which we can see. But he also has ultimate authority over all the invisible things which you cannot see, such as these thrones and powers and rulers and authorities. It's talking about these uh, spiritual forces in the unseen realm. Uh, you know, the spirit beings that we cannot see, which are uh, boasting against God and placing themselves as though they are gods, you know, in defiance of God. Even uh, Jesus, Jesus is Lord even over such creatures. So he very specifically, you know, talks about these four categories of spirit beings, the thrones and the powers and the rulers and the authorities. Now, this reminds us of our efficient passage. Because in the Ephesian passage, just before talking about the you know armor of God, uh, Paul he he writes over there and he says, you know, you guys are fighting against these four levels of spiritual authority. So you better wear your armor. If you're not fully clothed in your armor, you know, you may fall prey to these four levels of uh, demonic powers. So uh, those powers are mentioned over here, even in the Colossian passage, and. Um, Three of them are identical with the ones which he mentions over there in the Ephesians passage. In the Ephesians passage, he the first category that we he had talked about were the archas, you know, in the, in the Greek. Um, so these are the ancient ones, the most supreme ones. So here again, those the same archai are mentioned over here in this verse. He also mentions the exousia, the authorities who that were mentioned in the Ephesian letter. Uh, the ones who exercise, uh, you know, delegated authority. So those exousia are mentioned even over here. The same Greek words are being used. The archai, the exousia. Um, 
the third term seems to be a little different um you know in the efficient letter it talks about the powers uh, they are called the cosmo kratos the rulers of the cosmos the you know the the world rulers here uh, the word kurio is used you know they are they are called uh, lords or masters uh, so um, two different words in the efficient you have the term cosmo kratos here you have the uh, word kurio both of them basically mean lords and masters the the fourth one seems to be different uh, there in the efficient letter it talks about the evil spirits of this world uh, whereas here it talks about thronoi the thrones uh, so um, you know that's just one uh, different category that is mentioned over here uh, so you know in all of his interactions with the with the lord these are things which the lord has revealed to him that these are the kind of uh, demonic powers that are there in existence and our fight the fight of the church is against these forces so here uh, paul is saying all these you know very big powerful mighty spiritual powers even they are under christ christ is ultimately the superior authority he is the first born over all creation uh so these these things which you people are you know kind of uh, looking up to and beginning to admire okay, not the church the church was not doing that but you know other people were doing that and the church was getting kind of attracted in that direction so he's warning them he's saying the way the people of this world you know they 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 worship these creatures like as if they are something very big and great and for them it's like a great honor if one of those creatures comes and you know visits them and gives them a vision please don't go after such things he says you know hold on to christ because christ is in authority even over these the over these creatures he says all things have been created through him and for him so originally even these spiritual powers these you know these spirit beings they too were created through christ for christ to honor him to worship him to do his bidding and then they chose to rebel against him but actually in reality even these creatures were also created through him and for him um we in fact see that right about uh, uh, that ab uh, about about satan in ezekiel um if someone could just you know go to ezekiel and read out ezekiel chapter 28 look at the way it talks about satan over there what is he created for you know what has he been uh, um, made for Ezekiel twenty-eight verses fourteen and fifteen. If someone could read out Ezekiel twenty-eight fourteen and fifteen. We, you, we are the anointed cherub who who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. until iniquity was found in you amen yes amen yeah you know all of you a lot of you are reading out the verses without even me having to like urge and also thank you so much you know for uh, the very quick responses uh, today uh, yeah so here in ezekiel 28 it says so plainly in verse 20 uh, yeah 28 verse 15 from the day you were created satan was just a created being and he was created with a purpose what was he created for verse 14 it says he was ordained and anointed to be a guardian he was supposed to be this guardian uh, cherub you know this guardian angel who would be guarding the holy mount of god that was what he was created for so even satan you know was created through jesus for jesus to serve jesus to to guard this holy mount of god uh, and so the irony is that someone who was supposed to you know be guarding the holy mount of god chooses to rebel against god due, due, due to the pride in his heart he does that uh, so all these creatures are under the supreme authority of the first born over all creation so our focus should be on him not on these lesser beings uh we should long maybe for a visitation from him you know through his holy spirit 
rather than wanting visitations from all these evil spirits which 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 uh, which claim to be giving us mystical superior knowledge okay so um, so in verse 17 he says he, uh, jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together everything is being held together by this jesus not by the spirit beings it's jesus who is holding everything together um if you look at the visible world you know the the planets that we can see uh, the 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 natural uh, forces on earth you know the the oceans the winds everything it's all being held together uh, by jesus if jesus were to stop sustaining these things you know there would be complete chaos in a matter of minutes maybe the entire universe would just crash it would not be held in place in its proper positions you know without jesus holding on and sustaining it so it is that important he is in the center and everything is being held together by him through his authority and uh, so even the spiritual beings they wouldn't last a moment without him he has given temporary permission to them to you know wreak their havoc which is what they are doing right now but it's a temporary permission that is being given to them uh, we see that so clearly in john 12 31 where it says now is the time for judgment on this world now the prince of this world will be driven out so you know when the when the right time comes jesus is, just comes into the world and very casually he just drives the prince of this world out you know on the cross the prince of the world thinks that he's being very very clever by putting jesus on the cross but uh, actually it was jesus who was turning the tables on him so when the time comes jesus you know without any effort he's just able to drive the prince out uh, or prince of this world out of his position of power so that he can no longer hold humanity in slavery um the same thing is uh, jesus says even in john 14 30 he says i will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming he has no hold over me jesus says so the spirit beings which are you know which which uh, are described as thronoi the thrones the dominions all the big words which are used for them they have no hold over jesus jesus is supreme he holds them in place and gives them temporary permission to do what they want because god is going to even use this evil and he's going to turn it into good to accomplish his ways uh, so uh, god has his own purposes for allowing this but uh, the spirit beings have no hold over jesus so we our focus should be on this jesus rather than on the spirit beings um, you know is what paul is saying over here to his colossian audience and um, then he goes on to talk about how the church has the special privilege of being so personally connected to this very very supreme you know all sovereign jesus you know we have such a personal connection to this uh, highest of highest kings and lords uh, what is our very personal connection to him uh, that is talked about in uh, verse 18 onwards um if we could have someone read out for us uh, 18 19 20 please verses 18 19 20 of chapter 1 and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence for it please the father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross amen i mean just now in the previous verses we talked about how um, sovereign and supreme this jesus is in fact all of the universe would just crash if jesus was not holding it all together and this jesus who is so supreme and sovereign gets so personal and get so involved with such insignificant beings like humans this god of gods who is completely supreme he chooses to become the first born from among the dead 
I mean, imagine this supreme sovereign Jesus chooses to taste death on behalf of humans. Where's the need for him to even do that? But that's because of the love that this that God has. So, you know, it says um, in verses 19 and 20, it's so beautiful. Verses 19 and 20, it says, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in this Jesus so that through this Jesus, you know, both of them together can reconcile mankind to themselves. The love that God has for us. Such a supreme sovereign God, such a high status. He loves us so much that he allows this Jesus to come to this earth so that through Jesus, you know, God the Father and God the Son can reconcile humanity to themselves. Uh, so on behalf of us humans, Jesus chooses to taste death. And it's so beautifully expressed in Hebrews 2, 9, you know, where it talks about the high status of Jesus being made low on our behalf. This is what it says in Hebrews 2, 9. If someone could read out for us, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So for a little while, Jesus chose to become lower than the angels, so that you know he can um, identify with humans like us, you know, because we are anyway lower than the angels. I mean, at least we were earlier. That was our earlier status. Uh, so as sin, as slaves of sin, we were lower than the angels. So Jesus also chose to become lower than the angels, come and be, become one of us, represent us, and taste death for everyone on our behalf. He humbled himself in that manner. And then, of course, after having won the victory on our behalf, he once again rose above the angels. He now has got the glory which he had with the Father, which he originally had. He has got it back. Uh, so now, in that position of supremacy, he is acting on behalf of the church. So that is why in verse 18, Paul says, he became the firstborn from among the dead. He did that so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So remember who he is. He is supreme. Supreme. And now he has chosen to be supreme for us on our behalf by tasting death for us. So regard him as supreme in your personal lives is what you know Paul is reminding them and telling them. Um, and he goes on to talk about what Jesus has done for them in uh, verses 21 to 23. Um, this is you know just him urging. Um, giving them encouragement, telling them, see, this is what Jesus has done for you. So therefore, let him be supreme, you know, in your lives. So verses 21 or 23, uh, if, you could, if you could read out, uh, we will look at what Jesus has you know, um, uh, done for us. Yeah, 21 to 23. And you, who once to were alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has re reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and fast and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which, which you had, which you pre which was preached to every creature under heaven of which i paul became a minister amen amen so here um again he's referring to the gospel the true gospel which was proclaimed to every creature so what does this true gospel tell us this true gospel tells us that we used to be enemies of god once upon a time no, we were we were enemies, but Jesus chose to come down, and in his physical body, he chose to die for us, 
so now if we are reconciled to god through this jesus then you know one day we will be presented before the father without blemish free from accusation so the exact wording is this he says now he has reconciled you by christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if this an if, if over there mentioned if you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel there are two things that you christians need to continue doing he is saying to the people he is saying god will one day definitely present you without blemish you know you will be presented before god god will present you to himself without blemish free from accusation fully accepted no longer enemies considered as friends considered as loved ones as part of god's family this is how god will present you to himself if you do two things you need to continue in your faith established and firm and you should not move from the hope that is held out by the gospel so any true proclamation of the gospel will involve this message of faith and this message of hope if uh, the, the any true preaching of the gospel should talk about the heavenly hope the reward which is awaiting us and it should talk about the way we should live on this earth staying steadfast and firm in our faith no matter what suffering comes along no matter what doubts and questions satan throws at us we hold on we continue to obey in faith we do this because we have that eternal hope and reward to look forward to so he is saying that this is the gospel which has been proclaimed therefore stay firm in the lord let your eyes stay focused on jesus um so uh, then in verse 24 onwards um he talks about this commission which has given been given to him this mission which has been given to him by god uh, he talks a little bit about that uh, that would be verses 24 to 28 if we could have someone read out for us verses 24 all the way up to verse 28 I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my spirit what is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to to me for you to fulfill the word of God the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints to them god willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the gentiles which is christ in you the hope of glory him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in christ jesus amen amen so uh, here he says um I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Christ when he uh, cruci was crucified on the cross and he declared it is finished, he indeed finished everything that is required for our salvation for our redemption and deliverance. Everything that is required, Christ finished on the cross. So what is still lacking in the afflictions of Christ? somebody has to now take what you know somebody has to now go and tell people what christ has done otherwise it stays incomplete right uh, so he says now my job is to tell everyone to present to you the word of god in its fullness this mystery you know which is it was hidden in the, in the past but now jesus has come he has done his work on the cross he has finished what is required for us and now i am the messenger who is going and telling everyone that jesus has done this so that they can realize that they have hope of glory in this jesus how will they ever enjoy the glory and the praise and the honor which god wants to release upon them if nobody ever goes and tells them what jesus has done for them 
So someone has to do that. So in that sense, we all, all of us, the church, we are supposed to um, fill up in our flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. So Christ was afflicted. Christ finished whatever is required for humanity. He has completed the work of redemption. But now we need to go and tell people about this because only then they will discover this great mystery that people like us who were enemies and rejects, we now have hope of glory through Jesus, in Jesus. So we need to go and share this good news with people that they there is a future glory awaiting them, a great reward that is awaiting them. And that good news has to be shared by us. And by doing that, we will complete this work which Christ began. So Christ finished his work on the cross, but we need to do our part in telling people about this. And the wording that Paul uses to, to talk about this, you know, this work of um, going and sharing the good news. He says he's filling up this work in his flesh. Literally, he, he uh, this ministry that he has, this work which has been given to him, he literally feels the impact of it, the sacrifice of it every day in his physical body. You know, it, it's something which strains him. It's something which affects him. Are we um, fulfilling the work of Christ in that way, where we can literally feel the impact of it in our flesh? You know, it's something that we need to think about. Because when this man, you know, when he went from city to city, um, sharing the gospel, getting persecuted, getting beaten, uh, sometimes not having enough food and starving, sometimes uh, having uh, to go through shipwrecks, uh, sometimes getting arrested and being thrown in the jail. In all of these things that he was going through, he literally could feel it in his flesh. You know, He was filling up in his flesh this commission that was given to him by God. And we need to be that totally involved in ministry. Um, I mean, if we are not facing persecution today, excellent. I mean, that's good. Uh, it means that I you know the the uh, the environment is good and open, and we can go and do the gospel work uh, without any kind of obstacle. So it's really good if there is no persecution. Uh, but in other ways, in the in the, in the amount of effort that we put in, uh, the 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 amount of sacrifices that we are willing to make to be able to go and uh, minister to people. Are we literally filling up in our flesh this commission that God has given us, where we can feel the impact of it um, in our, in literally in our physical bodies? You know, it's something that we would have to uh, consider. So Paul was that enthusiastic in doing his part. He was filling up in his flesh on a daily basis uh, what uh, the whatever he needs to do for the for the sake of the church. And uh, so he says, you know, I'm, I'm presenting to the, uh, the word of God to everyone and letting them know this, this mystery that even they can now have hope of glory through Jesus. And um, he says, uh, this Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So. Paul's ultimate goal is that everyone should know Jesus to such an extent where they will become fully mature in him. So the, he wants the believers to be growing in, in, their, in their knowledge of what is the will of God. He wants them to be growing in the faith which they, uh, which they exercise in obeying him. He wants them to be growing in the love which they are showing sacrificially towards one another. He wants them to be growing in all of these aspects so that one day, each believer will be, will be fully mature in Christ. So that is his goal. And so that should be the goal of every person who is uh, you know, operating in some kind of leadership in the church. Our ultimate goal will be to present every person in our congregation fully mature in Christ. We got to urge them, open their eyes, and help them to see the exciting realities of heaven so that they will all exercise their hope and practice their love in such a way that Christ is pleased. Uh, and so that in the process, each of them will become fully mature in Christ. Okay, That should be the goal of every uh, leader who is ministering to the 
church. Um, so from there, we kind of move on into uh, chapter two. Of course, you know, we will be looking at chapter two in greater detail uh, in the next class. Um, OK, uh, yeah, Enoch says that they're having a um, blackout uh, in Nigeria uh, due to a lack of power supply. So yes, uh, yeah, we will maybe you know pray when we are having a concluding prayer. Yes, we will definitely put that as a prayer point. Um, yeah, so in the, in the little time that we have left, um, we let's get into chapter two. Um, if we could have someone read out for us the first five verses, yeah, chapter two, uh, verses one to five, please. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you, those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their, heart, their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfast fastness of your faith in Christ. Amen. Yes. So here he says, uh, you know, I wanted to know how hard I am contending for you. So he says, I'm going all out, you know, like, like I'm, I'm giving every bit of myself in uh, fighting for your spiritual uh, growth uh, of you guys in Colossia and the people in Laodicea and all the other places, people whom I have not even met personally. You know, I'm, I'm really uh struggling in prayer interceding for you you know writing to you encouraging you i'm doing all of this because um this is my goal my goal is that you may be encouraged in heart uh you know which is basically one way of saying you know that you may have hope that you may be encouraged in heart second that you may be united in love um and the uh, the third thing he says is that so that you may have a uh, complete understanding of the full riches which are yours. So again, we have that that trifecta being you know being brought out over here: faith, hope, love. All the three are being uh, mentioned over here. So he wants them to be encouraged in their heart and be full of hope. He wants them to be united in love, and he wants them to have a complete understanding of the full riches. You know that they'll so, so they'll be they'll be fully confident, and their faith will be. Uh, uh, fully bolstered up by the knowledge that you know there are riches which are backing them up, heavenly riches which are backing them up. So he says he wants them to have these three things, you know, in their full uh, capacity. That is his goal. Therefore, he is literally contending for them, fighting for them in prayer. He is, um, you know, writing letters to them. He's sending messengers to them who will uh, talk to the, talk to them on his behalf and encourage them. So he's doing everything that he can and he's doing all of this while sitting in prison in Rome. So we who are not constrained like him, you know, who have the freedom of movement to be to, to go around as we please, we should be contending even more than him because he was not, you know, he was not saying, OK, I'm under, under arrest. There's not much that I can do. And he didn't sit back. Even though he was in prison, he still had this burden and this passion to give his very best for them. So in the same way, whatever God has called us to, we should be contending and giving our best in whatever it is that God has no, uh, laid on our hearts uh, to do. So um, he says, um, in, this, um, in this Christ, we have uh, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So because in Christ, we have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, don't get deceived by fine sounding arguments, is what he says. Um, but rather, he says, 
you know, uh, he wants them to be uh, firm in their faith in Christ. So he says in verse 5 um, uh, that he's delighted to see how disciplined they are and how firm they are in their faith in Christ. Uh, so he wants them to continue being like that. He says, you know, in Christ, you have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You don't need some spirit coming to you in the middle of the night and giving you some kind of fake knowledge. Okay, so he says, do not be deceived by these fine sounding arguments. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, fine sounding arguments that were going around in that, in that church. Some of it might, would have come from the Judaizers, uh, of course. Um, but some of it was, was, was also coming from these uh, beginnings of the Gnostic philosophy, you know, where people were beginning to focus more on spirit beings and the spirit realm and things like that. So when, when, when people stand up and talk about these things, oh, it sounds so interesting. It sounds so fine. And people may get drawn away. They may think, oh, gospel message is so boring, so dull. Look at these exciting things which these people are talking about. They're talking about visitations from spirits. They're talking about uh, hidden knowledge and mysteries. Oh, that sounds so exciting. Gospel message, on the other hand, it sounds so simple, so simplistic. It, it, and it's all about sacrifice and the cross. So you see, the gospel message didn't doesn't sound very appealing to human ears. Uh, on the other hand, these other things sound adventurous and interesting. But um, it is in Christ that we have our hope. This is the mystery which Paul wanted to unwrap and you know tell us that our hope of glory is in Jesus. So he says, do not be deceived by these fine sounding arguments. Rather, hold on to the wisdom and knowledge which God reveals to us, which Jesus reveals to us, to us is what he uh, says. Um, so in the same, uh, you know, same line, uh, a line of thought, uh, he says in verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So he's saying all this philosophy, you know, which these people are, uh, you know, spouting just to cheat you. Uh, it is empty deceit. There's no power in it. It may sound very nice to the ears, but there is no power in it. It doesn't give you the power to uh, enter heaven. It doesn't give you the power to live a, a, a victorious life on this earth. It doesn't give you the power to walk into the abundance which Christ has for you. So you see, these things sound very fine to the ears. They sound exciting. They sound interesting. But they're empty. They're hollow. There is no power in any of these philosophies and teachings. Rather, the the the, the knowledge uh, and the what's it? the wisdom and knowledge, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge of Christ that contains true power. So hold on to that. Is what he says. Um, there's a term that he uses over here, which is you know translated differently in the NKJV. And in the NIV, uh, in the NKJV, it says, you know, do not be cheated uh, by the basic principles of the world. Whereas in the NIV, it says, you know, don't be cheated by the elemental spiritual forces of this world. So that Greek word that is used over there, some people think that it is just uh, that word refers to wrong principles and philosophies. But on the other hand, that same word can also be used talk about spirit beings which are conveying something wrong. So which is why in the NIV and some of the more modern versions, they prefer to use this particular term. They call it the elemental spiritual forces of this world. You know, uh, these there are there are in the spiritual realm, there are hidden uh, demonic forces which are releasing wrong thoughts and ideas into people's minds. No, because I mean, if you, if you actually look at uh, the current world scenario, there's so much stuff about new age spirituality. No, it's all uh, some kind of combination of white magic, black magic, and um, all kinds of uh, witchcraft and all of that. It's kind of whitewashed uh, to make it look good. 
and it sounds very interesting and you have a lot of stuff on youtube you know regarding all of that youngsters are getting attracted and drawn to such things uh, because it all sounds so mysterious and fun you know um, so there are actually uh, demonic uh, beings in the spiritual realm which are releasing these teachings and thoughts uh, into the world today so um, that term which is used in nkjv which just simply says basic principles of the world it's not just principles and thoughts and ideas it's the demonic forces which are releasing these thoughts and ideas so he says don't allow yourself to be cheated by these things because these things are all fake and there is no power in them all right so we'll conclude with a word of prayer and uh, next class you know we'll look in greater detail into uh, chapter 2 and then the remaining chapters so yeah let's pray Lord, we just thank you so much for today's class. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all the things that we could uh, learn. Um, uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would be excited about heavenly things, that we would realize the bigness and magnitude of what is waiting for us over there, so that we will not no longer be very interested in our little careers and our little promotions and our little gadgets and the things of this world and we will realize the bigness of what is awaiting us the glory of that is awaiting us uh, in the heaven several oh lord and we pray that as a result of that we will walk in faith no matter what sacrifices we have to make and that we will act in genuine sincere love towards one another even if it means um, you know, putting other people's interests before our own. Help us, O oh Lord, to live in that way. And we pray that if we are teachers or pastors or ministers, we will share this with other people so that they too can become excited about the things of God and so that we can get our eyes off wrong priorities. Lord, we also pray for Nigeria and the crisis that they are going through currently. We do not know the details, but we know that people are suffering, people are struggling. So, Lord, we just commit them into your hands, O Lord. Lord, make a way for them, O Lord. Help them in this time of crisis, O Lord. Give your wisdom to those in leadership over there so that they will know what steps to take, what decisions to take, so that, Lord, in, in, in the background, you would work and you would help your people to come through this crisis. Thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll meet again next class. Thank you, Pastor.